Monsters. When did you realize that beaver were delicious? Not till after. I, I think I ate, no, I ate the first one when I was in, the first one I ever ate when I was in community college. I still tell people about the beaver that you cook for us in Wisconsin and how yeah. good it is, and they look at you sideways, and I'm like, I'm telling you, man, it was like the most delicious pot roast I've ever had. It was fantastic. Yeah. It was really good. There's even stories about early on with the, um, when early explorers were in this country, they had a difficult time getting fish sometimes, and beaver were approved for the Lenten meal because they were aquatic. Wow. So on Fridays when you had to have, like when you're supposed to have your meat-free day, you were allowed to eat beaver meat because they were a water animal. It was a very popular food item. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get it. The, yeah. first, when, the first ones we ate, I had started reading about, I'd always read narratives, stories about the mountain men. Um, meaning like, when I say mountain men, like a very specific thing, like a, you know, a, a, a Rocky Mountain beaver trapper who was sandwiched between, who was sandwiched in time between the end of the Lewis and Clark expedition and the collapse of the beaver market in the 1840s. So like, it's like a very like finite period of time was what a mountain man was. Explain to people how big the beaver market is, because this is going to blow people's minds. Well, America's first, you know, Astor, John Jacob Astor, like the beaver market made America's first millionaires. His fortunes came from being a beaver trader. The, the richest men in the country, their money came from beavers. Yeah, and he was in on the business end of it. He wasn't in on the trapping end of it. Right, he was in on the hats, but the, right? But the, the fur companies, yeah, the big fur companies. Well, it was and when Louis, like when, and... Louis, when we bought, think about it like this, how big it was. For us to do the Louisiana Purchase and to buy that chunk of land, uh, when Lewis and Clark came out, part of their mandate was to suss out the potential for the trade in beaver hides. Wow. It'd be like buying something. Now you'd want to know about oil and gas, right? You yeah. know, can we justify this through oil and gas? They're looking to justify it through trade in beaver hides. Now, also, there was also language about that they might find out about whether woolly mammoths were existing out there as well. So there was like some confusion about what was going on. Wow. They really thought that woolly mammoths were still alive? Jefferson was interested in that stuff because he had, he had been to some areas – uh, he had some familiarity and been to some areas with these large bones, and he was puzzled about them. He was wondering if this wasn't some, if it maybe in fact was not a, an extinct species, but was somehow living in the American West still. How hard is it to wrap people? Historians, like people, not historians, <clears throat> popular historians, really love to make a big deal out of that because it's so weird. But it wasn't like, hey, let's buy the, let's do the Louisiana Purchase transaction because of the possibility of locating mammoths. I think it was like a, a, an idea that was floated around. People see it, and they, 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 people such as me see it, and perhaps overemphasize what it meant. But it was an idea that was out there. The beaver trade stuff was. Certainly a big factor. Another thing I was reading about recently that I just point out to your to your uh, th that you might think is interesting is that we uh, people have this idea of Lewis and Clark going into this unspoiled, uncontacted landscape. I was recently reading a piece by a historian who was talking about at the time Lewis and Clark headed out into the Great Plains, there were Native Americans living on the Great Plains who had been to Europe and met the King of France and returned back to the Great Plains. Whoa. What year? They, they went out in the early 1800s. So they were out in 1804. Wow. You, you gotta, if you imagine the time, from the time um, in the 1500s, when the Spanish, right, were poking around and come like Coronado, right, coming up from Mexico into the Great Plains, Cabeza de Vaca being shipwrecked along the Gulf Coast and people pushing up into these areas. That was hundreds of years prior. Like the distance that separates, imagine the distance that separated Lewis and Clark from the first Europeans who were doing activities in and around the Great Plains is like the distance in time that separates us from Lewis and Clark. More so, right? Yeah. It's the distance in time that separates us from the Declaration of Independence. It was like a long history of people That's messing crazy. around. That's crazy. However, so yeah, but think about it too, like Lewis and Clark were encountering people who had horses, right? Right. And those they horses had, had been, yeah, right. those horses been traded up. So that's just a, like a side note to this idea of eating beavers. So <laughs> I got 
from reading about the mountain men, I got interested in this idea because you would always see like anytime you're reading about mountain men, you're always going to find the part where the author talks about how much mountain men liked beaver tail. Um, and the first people that tried eating beaver tail, and it was around when I was, in, I, I was in community college at the time. And my brothers, I remember, stuck a beaver tail in the oven for a while and cooked it. And they reported back to me that like whatever it is they're talking about uh, isn't that. Like, there must be some other explanation. Didn't we eat beaver tail? Yeah. Yeah, we ate it in Wisconsin. Yeah. We have a, there's a, there's a, how to, like, there's like pictures and an explanation of how to prepare, how to actually prepare beaver tail mountain man style in the meat eater fishing game cookbook. It um, wasn't bad. It was no, just it's, bland. It's just fat. It's yeah. fat. So after that, we started thinking that when they say the mountain men like beaver tail, we thought it must have meant they like rump. Basically, like the hind quarters. Oh. So we started when we when I would catch beavers, um, I'd be careful when skinning them to not get the caster. The beavers have two large glands on the inside of their legs. They're like tucked in their what looks like if you lay a beaver on its back, tucked kind of on either side of its of, of its like if it's a male, like tucked either side of its penis or either side of its cloaca, you'll you'll see a uh, not cloaca but like vent. You'll see these these glands that are the size of. I don't know if you make like a, if you take your index finger and your thumb and make a circle, there's like a gland on each side called a castor gland. There's an oil gland in there. They used to use it for perfume. It still has value today. It's used for a wide variety of things. It smells beautiful. If you're ever walking on a stream bank and you smell like a strange perfume smell, it's usually beaver caster. Wow. Um, smells great. Tastes like shit. Tastes like you're eating, like you rubbed roses or something all over your food. So, Started figuring out like to, to skin them and be very careful not to get the caster on your knife or get the caster on your hands. And then we would just take the meat and put it in crock pots with potatoes and onions and stuff and just cook them down in a crock pot till you could pick them. And it was like roast beef. So then I started eating that, but I still, then later I realized that the, 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 it read other accounts of how people prepared beaver tail. And if you take the tail, like the scaly ass tail, and it really should be from a fall beaver. Because the tail will be twice as thick in the fall than it is in the spring. They're emaciated in the spring. Um, take the tail and just skewer it on a stick and put it next to a fire where the skin starts to bubble and boil away. And pretty soon you can just peel all that skin away. And what's hiding under there is the, the, the best equivalent like the best equivalent or point of comparison that I can think of would be just – it's like if you had a really – like imagine you're eating a grass-fed steak – Right, but still has that fatty gristle on it. It's just made up of that gristle. Like what a lot of people would trim away from a steak and not eat. That's what's inside that beaver tail. But people eat the, the, these individuals that were doing this were fat starved, mm. eating such lean meat all the time. I think they loved it because here's like a chunk of fat. Yeah. And they had ready access to it because they were catching them to make a living. And if you're just eating the meat, there's no fat on the meat. And so they would complement it with just eating the beaver tail fat. And I'll often tell people about it, and I even gave some to, like, there's like a, a culinary arts institute, and I gave some chefs that stuff. And everyone that eats it points out that it's not that it tastes so fantastic, but it's just like really interesting to try and eat it, the fat from the tail. And it's like you got to put yourself in a position, you've probably been in this too, where if you're, you know, especially if you're out hunting and eating you know, like freeze dried food or not eating great, and you're just exerting yourself all day, all the time. How you're, what you want to eat changes a lot. Yeah, and you, the level of appetite you have is off the charts. Yeah, and so just like to eat yeah. like a big slab of fat, you'd be very excited. Was about appealing it. to people. Yeah. 